which I love doing. <laughs> I really love doing. And as long as I make sense, keep me on. Cut me off when I stop <laughs> making sense. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, by the way, you sound uh, so very good. Um, uh, Bob Crane, uh, we had Bob Crane send you a telephone. and. Um, uh -huh. Oh, I know I got that lovely telephone. It's the stall I'm speaking on. It. What a difference it makes. All right. Uh, aren't Father Martin uh, talked of persons perfectly possessed by the devil? Yes. Um, you can ignore this question, Father, if you wish. In the opinion of Father Martin, is Bill Clinton perfectly possessed? Uh, no comment. I had a feeling that uh, you might say that. Um, all right, um, this as well. Please ask the Father to tell us anything he can, or he's willing to, about the prophecy of Fatima. Well, the prophecy of Fatima, uh, without going into my background in this matter, um, the prophecy of Fatima is not a pleasant document to read. Uh, there's not pleasant news. It implies, uh, it doesn't make any sense unless we accept that there will be, or that there is in progress, a wholesale apostasy amongst clerics and laity in the Catholic Church, uh, that the institutional organization of the Roman Catholic Church, that is the the, the organization of parishes, dioceses, archbishops and bishops and cardinals and uh, the Roman bureaucracies and the chanceries throughout the world, um, unless that is totally disrupted and rendered null and void, the third secret makes no sense. And number two, uh, the other salient characteristic about it is uh, that it means intense suffering I don't know what the believers. I don't know what the third secret is, Father. The third secret, Lucia, Sister Lucia, who's still alive, the only surviving child of the three Fatima children. She's 89 now. She lives in Coimbra, in the Carmelite convent in Spain. Uh, she was prevailed upon by her bishop to write down the third secret, Our Lady conveyed two secrets to the children. We know the first two, but the third secret, uh, she, uh, Lucia, since she was the only survivor, refused to tell anybody. And finally the bishop said, look, uh, we're all getting on in age, sister, write it down, and we'll send it over to the Pope. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it's not destined for the Pope, it's destined for the people. Well, he said, the Pope will tell the people about it. So she wrote it down, and uh, this is in the 30s, and then in the 50s it was conveyed over to Rome to Pius XII, Pope Pius XII, and Cardinal Ottaviani, who was the head of the Holy Office of that time. Uh, they put it away because Lucia said that it shouldn't be opened except by the Pope in 1960 because the thing would be clear then. So it was opened by John the 23rd in February 1960, and he proceeded to say that it wasn't true. It was unreliable. And the children didn't know what they were talking about. And Lucia didn't, because when she got this supposed secret from the Virgin, uh, she was illiterate, and she was under 10 years old. So she couldn't know what she was talking about. And John twenty third, uh, then in his opening speech at the Vatican Council on uh, October 11, 1962, referred contemptuously to the three children as prophets of doom, and said, "We, we today, we don't need, we don't need have anything to do with these prophets of doom, because uh, we are in a different age." And so he suppressed the secret. And, it, and it remains so today? It remains so today. And it's uh, P J uh, Paul VI read it, Pope Paul VI, and did nothing about it. John Paul I read it and did nothing about it, but he only lived for 34 years as Pope. And John Paul II has read it twice and has done nothing about it. He has spoken about it in public, uh, but he has done nothing about it. And that's the status of the secret today. 
Um, do you do you do you know what it is? Yes, but I'm under oath. Do you yes. consider um, do you consider it to be the ravings of a uh, illiterate uh, child? No, no. It's a very exact description of what is now happening and apparently what is going to happen shortly, but in cold, hard terms. There's no. There's no exaggeration. There's no use of adjectives or adverbs or anything like that. It's a blanket statement. Uh, a very factual thing stated baldly uh, with no adulteration, no flourishes, no purple patches. In other words, they got exactly what they asked for. Yeah, it's a frightening document. It's very frightening. All right. First time caller line, you're on the air with Father Malachi Martin. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, this is Eric in Houston. Hello, Eric. Uh, yes, uh, two, one quick comment and uh, then a, a question. Yes, and uh, in, in addition to the, the mount, I don't want to seem flip about it, but the mounting bo body count, uh, let's not forget the archbishop down in Guatemala that was assassinated. Oh, yes, let's not forget that. You're quite right. And uh, the other thing I have to say is you've spoken yeah, very early on, you spoke about a, seculariz a secularizing tendency in the Vatican, and I'm just wondering if you're not looking at the past through sepia-colored glasses, yeah. uh, leaving aside the Borgia popes and all that. I mean, in the last hundred years, you know, there, there was a sort of, uh, up until very recently, uh, kind of a cozy relationship in, in, with the church in Italy and the mafia, Mm. You had the relationship with the, the Vatican and Mussolini uh, that established mm -hmm. the Vatican State in 1929. And then you had the fact of uh, the Vatican accused of running uh, Nazi war criminals on, the, on, on their way through so to South America. Yes, yes. Would you care to comment? Well, you, you have sort of listed a series of uh, deficiencies of Vatican officials in the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, although I would not characterize the relationship between Mussolini and the Vatican as in any terms loving. They hated each other, but they both profited. Mussolini wanted the support of the Vatican. He was afraid the people would revolt against him. He wanted its approval, and the Vatican wanted to break out of its uh, closure and get its own sovereign state, which it got in 1929 only through Mussolini. So, but, but with that restriction, though, sure, there were churchmen who provided the rat lines for the escaping Nazis. There's no doubt about that. How could that possibly have been justified? It wasn't. Uh, justified by, by, by money and ambition and stupidity and evil. And, and nobody's justifying it today at all. We how, all how, how then, Father, does that uh, separate the Vatican then or now from whatever else goes on in the world that we decry and worry, worry so about? Well, it's something which uh, we hope will never happen again. There's no excuse for it at all, none whatever. And uh, I'm the first person to say it was wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, and that there's no excuse for it. It was a bad mistake by uh, churchmen bent uh, ideologically and not with any love of Christ. Mm -hmm. So there's no excuse for that. Now, secularization I'm talking about, though, is where the, the behavior of Vatican officials doesn't differ from the behavior of the Dalai Lama or the Archbishop of Canterbury mm. or the uh, Protestant monks of Taizé. And uh, indeed, there is a great assimilation taking place. And yes. that is secularization. Besides, the, the, uh, the Pope appearing on the same stage as Bob Dylan, you know, uh, okay, yes. but uh, it's a funny situation. It's funny, funny. It's funny. Yeah.